it's at the Thank library you. board. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Vredeveld, president of TBD Solutions. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Fault Lines, Understanding the Impact of COVID-19 on Behavioral Health Services. Okay. Attendees for today's webinar will be muted and will remain in listen-only mode throughout the presentation. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions and our presenters will take those questions at the conclusion of their presentation. You should be able to find that Q&A function on the top right panel. It's now my honor to introduce our two speakers for today's webinar. Dr. April Foreman is an executive committee member for the board of the American Association of Suicidology. April is known for her work at the intersection of technology, social media, and mental health with nationally recognized implementations of innovations in the use of technology and mood tracking. Dr. Foreman's dream is to use her unique skills and vision to build a mental health system that is effectively and elegantly designed to serve those who need it. Travis Atkinson is a crisis system specialist with TBD Solutions. Travis serves as president of the Crisis Residential Association and co-chairs the Crisis Services Committee for the American Association of Suicidology. As a songwriter and mental health advocate, Travis strives to help build a world where people are free of unhelpful pain and unnecessary suffering. Please join me in welcoming two great individuals, Travis Atkinson and Dr. April Foreman. Thank you very much, Laura. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I believe it's afternoon now across the country. Uh, my name is Travis Atkinson, and I am so pleased to have my uh, colleague and friend, April Foreman, uh, with me on today's webinar. Uh, April, would you like to say hi? We can just make sure your audio is working. Uh, sure. I wish, like we we talk about the SPSM show being the Muppet Show of suicide prevention, and I totally wanted like a Muppet Show sort of intro with like the Gonzo and the whole thing. But here we are in audio. I can't see all the people, but I'm just waving out there in the cyberspace, hoping that you're having a fantastic afternoon as we head into the eve of Suicide Prevention Month. Thank you for bringing that up, April. That's a good reminder, and um, I, there will be some uh, alluding to Muppet lore in this uh, in this webinar today. So I want to start by talking a little bit about fault lines, which is the name of this webinar today. So fault lines are areas where you uh, know that uh, an earthquake um, either has come before or has a good chance of coming again, um, and there are people in the uh, in, in our world like a seismologists or seismologists that study how and where fault lines are and where those risks happen. So this is a map here of earthquake hazards in the United States uh, within the next 50 years. Now this was made about five years ago, so we'll take that back to 45 years. Uh, but this is kind of a predictor to say we can expect that the highest hazards are going to take place, for example, along the West Coast or in so southeastern Missouri or in northwestern Tennessee or even way down in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, this is a gift to have knowledge like this so that we can make preparations appropriately. Sometimes we can predict uh, natural disasters or, or earthquakes. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes the disaster does not show what we're vulnerable to in the future. And that can be scary, but fault lines uh, after a disaster or after a tragic event has happened can help us to predict or prepare at least to make sure that an event like that doesn't happen again in the future. So bring yourself back to March 2020, uh, where you started to maybe get inklings of, of, a, of a virus happening and, and wondering, and, and, and it's probably so hard for us to think about the, the, the shutdown when we stopped doing our work um, or what life was like in January or February of 2020. Um, April, where were you? Uh, and was it sometime in March? Do you remember kind no, of no, that? No. 
We got to back this up. Not only do I know what was happening, I have screenshots of when I was aware of what was happening, and it was a, it was earlier than this, and this is what she okay. is me off. So, um, and I'm, and I'm going to be at a like at a summit for um, the Los Angeles sort of suicide prevention summit, and this is what made me go look for this. But um, I actually, the first time I had thought about suicide prevention and pandemics was July of last year. Um, I was in London. I was on a on a site visit for the National Health Services um, uh, urgent care team, and there was a wonderful woman named Ruth Allenson who was in charge of developing their their crisis their their urgent care lines pandemic response. And I never really thought like pandemic is a word that I associate with like a fun like tabletop game, like not <laughs> my, like not something I thought about like in my professional life. And I thought, oh. And I said, what do you mean pandemic? And she's like, oh, well, several years ago, we realized that there could be a global pandemic and someone just, you know, thought we should prepare for it. And here's what we've done. And I thought this was brilliant. Uh, in England, they have something called the press two option that they're using for this. And it's really cool. And so I learned about it. And then I had got um, contacted by um, a colleague uh, at, at Google. Uh, her name is Ruha. And um, she is with Google's um, disaster sort of management team. And she was also like thinking through these big disaster scale things and said, what is a suicide prevention? And I said, and this was in December, and I was like, Ruha, please meet Ruth. Um, we're all asking the same question. This is like this wonderful academic exercise. Cool, let's talk about this. This is December, so just a few months ago, right? Like. Yeah. And then um, I have an email um, in February, and it's to Ruha because I'm watching the news, and I'm watching all sorts of weird news, like news that's not like right in front of our faces news. Yeah. And and I was like, so Ruha, do you think that this pandemic thing might be a thing? Because I'm worried that it might be, and we should start thinking about what to do about it. And I also brought it up um, in a work setting. And everyone was like, there's no need for us to be alarmist. This is like, we don't need for everybody to get worked up about something like that mm. basically looks like a doomsday movie. And in fact, within three weeks, I was grounded from all travel. Within three weeks of the, do you think this is like, should we, you know, like, oh my God. Like, and then it was three weeks later, it was um, March 11th. And I was like, um, well, holy F, uh, this is it and changed my life, right? <laughs> yeah, you had a little bit, I mean, foresight, so to speak, but uh, th that's a that's a great uh, cont contextual story to put that whole thing into play and, and to frame it. It almost felt like uh, one of these movies that we've seen, right? Right, Like the end of the world kind of uh, framing where a Jeff Goldblum, you know, kind of comes in. It's like, uh, I can't remember what his line was from Jurassic Park, but um, just something a little ominous. And then to see it all play out uh, seems uh, stranger than fiction. So, so we we all have this shutdown. We we think about our loved ones. We try to you know protect our immediate concerns. Um, but where my mind went pretty shortly after that is what are our our colleagues doing in behavioral health care, and how are we responding to this, or how should we respond to that? Um, and so, April, I thought about people like you, and I remember uh, speaking to you sometime in, in probably in April or even March about this. Um, and it reminded me of uh, a scene from The Muppets Take Manhattan, uh, where <laughs> the, the Muppets were. That's every call with me. That's every that is call every call. Me. Yeah. Well, and you have, like, you have like this red curtain too sometimes. When, like, if, I wish if, you know, if we had your video, maybe you could have showed that off. But, like, I'm sitting right next to it. Yeah. You are perfect. So I, I was reminded of this scene, but from the Muppets Take Manhattan, where they're trying to pitch their their movie or their musical to some producers, and and it doesn't work out, and they all disperse. But then they they find out that somebody does want to pick it up, and so they're making calls to each other all across the country, and you know, and like those those oversized bears that that you know Fozzie's in the same cave, and they they wake up and they you know they they scoot to New York as fast as they can, and and um, you know, an, an animal is found banging on some some pots and pans somewhere, and he gets he gets called. It's just like all these friends come together, all these colleagues come together to to do some to try to do something bigger than themselves. And I felt like. And to be fair, Travis, you were one of my first calls. And, well, and I'm not trying to butter you up for the audience who's like, and so if they want to understand the story of how this unfolds, Travis, you were one of my first calls. That is that is very sweet. We'll we'll verify that with Verizon for sure. But um, I'm gonna believe you for now. Um, 
But so you and I had these conversations and and we actually were able to help work on a, a, um, a and, and not a, not an exercise, but a, um, a project which led in, in the creation of COVID mental health support dot org. But that's not really not, not what we're talking about today. We're talking about how did these agencies uh, come together to identify how we could be helpful? You know, there's that line uh, uh, that a lot of people have been talking about from Fred Rogers, the, he, who said that his mother said, look for the helpers, you know, in times of crisis or in times of great need. But I, I'm curious, what about those people that already were helping people, those people in behavioral health or in crisis or suicide prevention services, what were they doing, right? So uh, we had some conversations with some of these organizations that are national leaders in crisis services, like the American Association of Suicidology, of which you and I are both uh, proud and active members, uh, the National Association of Crisis Organization Directors, and the Crisis Residential Association, to say, how can we be the most helpful right now? What type of information do we need to bring to the fingertips of the people who are making decisions or the people who are providing care? And so what we came up with was a national survey of behavioral health crisis providers to get a sense of what exactly is happening and how we need to uh, maybe adapt or pivot in order to make sure that these services can continue to be provided in times of, of crisis. Now, April, um, I, I, there are a, a couple of, of challenges that I wanna talk with you about as we're framing this discussion. Um, and one of them has to do with the dearth of information around crisis services, how they function, and where they're located. Um, and, and and maybe there's maybe there's frustrations along the same uh, parallel uh, to those that that you know that you can think of. But what have you seen as as barriers that maybe just were only um, magnified in situations like this, or that have left us with something to be desired uh, when it comes to the information that we need around mental health and, and suicide prevention services. So I already had a pretty good idea, and this is why you were one of my first calls. Um, I had been thinking about these things ahead of time. And so like sort of pre-step one, sort of step like little IA or whatever, is <laughs> that I knew when they were talking about this when I was at the, you know, at the NHS in July, and I knew when, the, you know, the Google folks, I understood that this was an event that people were thinking about. I understood that my, my industry would be called upon to respond, and I understood that here in the United States, like, this really hadn't been thought about or discussed in any serious way. And, and by serious, I mean, you think about it, you discuss it, and you tie action items to it, and you act as if you really could have a pandemic, and you prepare as if you really could have a pandemic, and mm -hmm. like, we just haven't done that. And the typical way for those who are listening, and many of the folks on this call will know, and I didn't know until I was in this industry a few years ago, typically what happens is that there are a few major national players, whether they are people in the public health space that are parts of um, you know, state and federal agencies, or there are people who are national level organizations, and they'll come together and they'll have some sort of task force. And task force have not a lot of tasks and not a lot of force, um, at, typically speaking, not at least most of the ones I've attended, and mm -hmm. not a lot of action items, and no one that really makes them, because this is just a group of, you know, friendly people who work in the same field who kind of come together. And um, I've seen the, the sort of pace that those things move at and sort of the difficulties because I've been to so many of them as, as many people have been on this call. And I've also talked with reporters and I've talked with the public a lot. And so the public's perception of what we do as a field is that we have like a ticker and we're entering data and we really know things and we know things at the speed at which they're happening because mm. we're unified and well coordinated in some way. And I know that's not true. And so I knew that one of the big challenges that we were going to have as a field is that people would want information from us to shape public action. And we would fundamentally be unprepared to provide that information at the speed of the crisis. Yeah. And that's no bueno. Quite honestly, that's just like, that's an infrastructure failure and that's a mission failure, in my opinion. I'm not here to point fingers and say we are failures, but it's like, come on. Like that's not that's not what we're about. A little and maddening. I called you. 
So, yeah, oh, for sure. And I called you because you had done something incredibly important in our field and in, rel in a relatively unsung way. And this is a story I will, these are the kinds of stories I will be telling at my retirement. Um, uh, <laughs> if, if, should I be so lucky, right? Is and like important moments on our history, which is a couple of years ago, you know, we had been saying the, the story of how many crisis organizations are out there and who's got basically the roster and how do we know who they are and how would we coordinate them? And you were like the first person ever that, to my knowledge, who sat down and like did any kind of like intentionally finding everyone and you had found about 700 organizations. And your, your, um, this is, once again, I get no money for this. This is just me. I really care. Like, this is why I'm talking to Ruha and Ruth Allenson and why I called you Travis on many very early morning walks as I was marching around my neighborhood in quarantine or whatever, yes. was that you had a list of who all the people were. So if we wanted to get information quickly, you were, you and, and, and TBD Solutions had worked with AAS to partner about that but that not everybody had like free and clear access to that list for, and for lots of reasons that, that that's just not like openly published. Um, and so if, and that you also really had thought about the crisis sphere as more than just call centers. And so if we wanted to understand what was happening, you had the permission to quickly use technology to contact folks and start to size up the situation. And I knew that, because um, I've been to so many of these task force meetings, that official, like official channels for this, like haven't, like th typically when we're publishing suicide information, we're publishing that two years later. And the, the national um, systems that should have had the information that you got never did do it, like not even function enough to get the list. And so I was like, I'm going to call Travis and we're going to figure out how to size the situation up. Because sure shooting, report is going to call me, and the only thing I'm going to be able to tell them is, sorry, the system's so broken, we don't even know who everyone is. Mm -hmm. And instead of, we can tell you who is there, and we can tell you what's happening. And I called you to figure out what to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you just brought up a point that I was going to mention that came up on a call yesterday, which is, think about this. We have daily updates about COVID cases and COVID deaths. We wait two years for our suicide uh, deaths in states. And what, what, where is the disconnect? You know, why can we not have real time data when it comes to crisis services and suicide prevention? So thank you for sharing those examples or sharing that context. I and, think that helps hopefully and, everyone and to understand. I want to correct some language here. We can have that. We can, we can yes. We have a lot of things, but the people who, who can make that happen either haven't been given the resources or haven't given the permission. Yep. And that's unacceptable. And the public thinks it was done a long time ago. And the public should know that did not happen. Mm -hmm. Which is just Sorry. a tip of the iceberg on our on our behavioral health uh, deficiencies when it comes to data. So thank you. That's right. that's a great framing. Before we get into the results of the survey, I just want to for for those of you for people on the call that maybe don't have strong familiarity with what the crisis continuum looks like, I want to give an, a a sense of what this how this worked or how the behavioral health system and crisis services evolved from uh, before the 1970s until now. So think about that message that uh, everybody has on their doctor's office uh, voicemail. If this is an emergency, hang up, dial 911, or go to your nearest uh, emergency room, or perhaps the, the police will be dispatched by 911 and they can take you where you need to go. The problem is we've used that same logic to deal with behavioral health emergencies. And when you follow those same pathways, most of the time people end up in the psychiatric hospital. Uh, when everything, when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you don't have a developed continuum of mental health services, then any emergency looks like a psychiatric hospitalization. So we'll take this and we'll compare it to what has evolved in the last 40 or so years, where people start to have options. They, the, the, the police that are responding are replaced either by mobile crisis teams or co-responder teams. 911, uh, instead people are calling the suicide prevention hotline or the crisis call center in their community. 
And after that point of mobile crisis, people can be referred to a crisis stabilization unit where they only have to stay for 23 hours or a crisis residential facility, which is a home-like environment where people can receive crisis care. Or in some cases, if people are experiencing emotional distress and we know that um, prevention work or, or early intervention work, I should say, can help to prevent psychiatric hospitalization or emergency room utilization, then people can go to a peer respite facility to get care as well. So we chose three of these services that are in the, in the highest uh, concentration or, the, or the, the largest numbers to focus on as we looked at these surveys. We chose crisis call centers, mobile crisis teams, and crisis residential facilities. So we did two surveys. I showed you the second one here, but um, April Foreman, you are a, a PhD psychologist, and I'm, uh, but I am wondering if you know who this is. Five seconds, April Foreman. Do you know? So I've been booted out. I've been booted out of the. Um, of the live event to even watch on the screen. So if you were showing me something, okay. I cannot see it. I'm so this sorry. Is, yeah, this is like playing one of these games with a blind person, then it's not very fair. So um, this is Montel Jordan. Okay. And the reason, the reason that we're showing Montel Jordan is because this is the part of the presentation where we tell you, this is how we do it. So this is the method. Woo! This is the purpose yeah. of, of what we were trying to do with this survey, okay? So uh, we wanted to understand the landscape of crisis services during COVID-19. How is COVID affecting the ability to deliver services, the acuity of the people that are presenting for crisis services? Are they seeing people they've never seen before? Um, you know, are, are, are access channels or referral channels not there when they were there before. So here's some details. We, we in our first survey, uh, gave a, a, a four question online survey. And in our most recent one that was administered in June, we administered a, an eight question online survey. So this is open to crisis providers. Uh, there's a section uh, for managers that was the same as the April 2020 survey. So we really focused on managers and directors in April, and in June we opened it up to anyone. Um, we added some additional narrative questions, and we promoted this survey in partnership with the Crisis Residential Association, the American Association of Suicidology, and the National Association of Crisis Organization Directors. Uh, but a cool thing that we were able to do in this second survey was something called topic modeling. And we did that with Dr. Philip Resnick through the University of Maryland. Uh, and so what we did is we were able to take the narrative responses that people gave and, and analyze them uh, using some algorithms to understand what the themes were or what the common language that was being used in these surveys. Um, and April, I know you were one of the people that connected us with Dr. Resnick. Uh, anything else that you'd like to <laughs> yeah. add about our uh, about how this opportunity sprang up or what got you excited about it? Uh, yeah, so let's, so let's talk about that for a couple of reasons. So remember what I said about task force, and this is one of those um, things where I'm where because I'm really speaking from this position of like this sort of broad position. Um, um, as an executive committee member and as a person who just sort of has, has been in the suicide prevention space in a number of roles. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want to get tasks done with four, some, it, like the simplest design is the best. And so um, to the extent that I could, I was interested in hooking up people who had a lot of freedom to do what they thought was right quickly. There are reasons to use the system as it is. And when, when you have consistent systemic breakdowns, then you just need to bring together people like who, who are free and clear to act and who you know are good actors. And Dr. Philip Resnick um, is one of the members of the AAS Technology and Innovations Committee. Uh, Travis, you are uh, leading an AAS Crisis Care Division subcommittee. You folks that are members and you're specifically regularly do work. And, and Philip Resnick calls me and he says, do you know anything about crisis services? Do you know anyone who's trying to get data about the community quickly? And I said, in fact, I do know someone. I mean, he called me and said, like, do you know what's going on? And I had literally just had a phone call with you. Like, um, uh, all of my neighbors see me talking about suicide data, like just lapping my neighborhood in my 1.5 mile lap that I do. And it's really funny. They all know you because I they see me on the phone with you guys all the time. Yeah. And he says, listen, I um, can get 
some National Science Foundation grant money to do some free text analysis. So like if someone's trying to basically collect any data, I can I have some grant money and can rapidly get this money and get some support to assist. And I would like to assist the suicide prevention community, and here's why that's appropriate for this grant. And I said, do I ever know somebody and put them in touch with you? One of the things that I am a notorious, notoriously bad about is I'm a notorious flake when um, I'm trying to accomplish a lot sometimes. And I have a lot of official roles and I'm sort of in the middle of my official work, which was like I was almost working like every waking hour for a while, but I was like, listen, I can get the two of you on the call and I will do everything I can to facilitate any kind of work that can get done because I understood that any data that was going to come out quickly would have to be just this, everyone would agree and, ha and would have to have such a small chain of approval and would have to be so yes. relatively apolitical that it could get done quickly. And the two of you got together. What, I would love for the official system to work like it needs to work, but it was incredibly hard for that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it'll, it'll all come online there. And one of the things the official system will ask for is, is some sort of data and sur surveillance is a tough word in the crisis care system, but a survey, you know, data surveillance that would that so that you don't have to build it right then, but you and Philip largely could. And, and so now take it away. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, you bring up a good point, which is that we needed the nimbleness of immediate access to data that a, a, a report in uh, in 12 months that said what crisis providers needed in that moment would ultimately not have been helpful. Uh, and so we we needed a way to get to, to move quickly so that we could get this information around. The first survey we did um, between uh, April, or between the, I think it was the first and the sixth or the first and the 11th of April, uh, we were able to turn that around in two to three weeks to get the answers back. And the second one was within a month. So that's the speed at which we need this information to come. Um, so I'm gonna go over some themes of the survey results and provide some context for where the topic modeling comes in because that it, you're gonna see that here in the first section. So first of all, we had about six themes. The first was staffing. So the morale of staff, the stability, think of a crisis call center that has that relies on volunteers or interns. Well, colleges, universities closed, sent kids home, they lose their, their workforce. Uh, health concerns, uh, you know, staff who have no choice but just have to um, you know, go and 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 serve someone every day in a in an in-person setting, they're gonna feel anxious because they're a frontline worker. And by the way, a lot of these conversations about healthcare workers and and supporting them, there wasn't a caveat really for behavioral healthcare workers. And that could make them feel excluded when they really were treated as essential workers, uh, but should have been respected in that way and, and compensated in that way. The next theme was clinical services. So the presence or consistency of those reliable treatment interventions, you know, uh, because of COVID, has your staffing changed such that you can't offer that DBT group at your crisis residential facility, or you can't do an in-person uh, uh, assessment, which have proven to be more effective than a phone assessment. Equipment and supplies and technology. Unfortunately, even today, crisis providers continue to struggle with access to a pipeline of the appropriate equipment. Uh, one thing that CRA was actually able to do in that space was connect uh, a, a national association of, um, of, of like spirit makers. So think of like uh, of alcohol um, uh, distilleries, I should say, um, who are making hand sanitizer and connect them with the community crisis residential programs so that they wouldn't have, you know, this this log jam of trying to get equipment. And then the last two operations and sustainability. So can you keep doing this day in and day out with these adjustments that you're being asked to have? And then community resources, those places that you would typically refer people so you could discharge them from your service in a, in a given amount of time. What if those aren't there? Then what do we do? April, um, can you happen to see this slide by chance? Um, it's a map. No, Microsoft Teams now totally wants me to sign into an LA County account. I can't get into anything. I'm so oh, sorry. Side work, okay. Um, this was going to be a surprise for April, but now it'll just be a surprise for the rest of the group. April, this is a map, and it has it, it's the city of Baton Rouge, and it has uh, probably about 12 or 14 red dots on it. 
And mm -hmm. as, as you go through my description, as if we're on one of those, those game shows where we have $100,000 mm -hmm. at stake, um, mm -hmm. what would you think there are 12 to 14 of in Baton Rouge that this map might represent? Most of them are, you know, south, southeast of the center of the city, you know, most, maybe along uh, 110 or 12. You want to just give a guess on what they might be? Uh, drive through daiquiri shop. Ooh. The drive through you actually got really close. Um, these are actually all of the Sonic uh, locations in Baton Rouge. Um, cool. Sonic, Sonic uh, when I uh, spent some time living in Chicago, uh, they would do commercials, but there was no Sonic within 90 miles. So I grew quite an affinity for something that I couldn't have. And um, But we can find <laughs> out, we can find out where the Sonic is whenever we want to. You know, we can find, we can make a map of Sonics in the U.S. What we couldn't do up until a couple years ago was create a map of where the crisis facilities are or crisis services are in the U.S. And that's really important, oh, sure. you know, from an access oh, perspective. Can we, and can, so, we, can we take a pause? Because I've talked with the Google people about this, like quite a lot, like a lot yeah. of Google people about this. Yes. So, not, so, so this is a real challenge. So if you talk with Rua, if you talk with other folks in the Google space, one of the real challenges that they have when it comes to mental health services and crisis services is that they don't have accurate information and um, and they really don't have accurate information and they weren't sure how to do that. And I was like, let me tell you what, like I know where the only <laughs> list of 700 crisis centers is and like why, and, and they were like, oh really? And I was like, oh yeah. And so when even Google is not sure where we all are and how we connect and what to tell people about us, we've done effed up. Yes, and Sorry, I think now that speech. now that you say Ruha's name in that context, you actually connected me with with uh, Ruha like I, maybe a year or two are ago. You guys, so. I, I I came to the audience, but are you hearing a theme? Like I don't do anything, but I do help people make phone calls. <laughs> I'm like you are the, you are I'm a like great the connector. Four one one of yes. Of, uh, I'm the four one one of suicide prevention. Like I don't know anything about this, but I know a cool person, nope. and I try to only connect people who can do things with people who can do things. Yeah, but keep going. Yeah. So this next map that we have up here is a map that TBD Solutions put together of all of the crisis call centers and crisis residential facilities uh, that we know of in the United States. Um, so we spent about five years tracking this information and we think it's important. It's important for many reasons. Um, you know, funders and, and, and payers or state behavioral health administrators should probably have some network adequacy requirements on how quickly these services can be accessed to people in their community. But individuals who need crisis care should also know how to access them. And if they're in-person services, they should know where those are too. These shouldn't be hidden under a rock and behind a door and in a manila envelope somewhere on someone's floor, uh, you know, these should these should be clearly accessible and we should know where these services exist because this is also part of a quality conversation to say, OK, they may exist, but how do we know that they're that they're doing their job really well? Um, so this this type of information helped us to gather a lot of responses to these surveys. So what I've got up here is um, a, a, a few bar charts uh, that compare the April and June surveys that we did. So I've circled on the bottom here, the April surveys. And what I want you to pay attention to right now is the dark orange section. So this is this is the audience, not necessarily you, April. Um, so you'll notice that the services that experienced the largest decrease in utilization or in call volume was crisis residential services. And that seems to make sense because it's the only of the three that has to be done in person. So there was more than 50% of respondents to the April survey that said that they had a decrease in services. Now mobile crisis, about half of them said it, they also experienced a decrease in referrals. And then over 25% of call centers said that they experienced a decrease in referrals. But this was an important data point for us back in April because there were some uh, there was some information going around about whether or not crisis call centers were experiencing an increase in call volume or a decrease. Now the source that said that the increase was largest was the disaster distress helpline. And there were reports of 500 
600%, 600%, I think even 800% increases in call volume to the disaster distress helpline. But by my understanding, those comparisons were made to the previous year at the same time of the year. Um, and there were there was, to my knowledge, no global pandemic happening in March of 2019. And so it makes sense that that hotline would be used uh, more. But what we learned from uh, from polling all kinds of crisis call centers, not just the ones that take calls from the disaster distress helpline, is that the results were really mixed, that some of them reported an increase, but half of them reported a decrease or no change. And so the 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 result, the it was kind of, um, uh, you know, we were kind of waiting a little bit to understand that metric better. Now compare that to the June surveys where uh, about 60, 62% of the call centers reported an increase. Uh, in services, um, it, which was the largest uh, that group that reported an increase of the three. Um, so what we can see is how trends were happening across these services in a way that we've really never had access to this level of data before. So we're going to go on next to supervisor and, challenge. And, and, yes, and I need, April. And, and I just need for us to pause and I because I, I'm hoping like I'm imagining folks listening to this right now. And that is a really big deal to have that level of, of sight on it, because one of the things that we think is happening with this pandemic is that it has highly differential impact on people based on their region, like whether it's impacting their job, whether it's impacting their health, has a lot to do with the specific infection rates and the economy and what day it is. And it's not the same from region to region. And this idea that everyone was going to go in crisis in the US at once was like a really, um, you know, overly simplified national narrative because it makes a really great news clip. But what we, and, and of course, if you want to, and, and I'm all for funding the disaster distress helpline, and that's great, but it went from, you know, so, you know, dozens of calls to a few hundred calls, right? And like, like, which is important, but it doesn't help us really deploy resources. It's great. It's a great vehicle for getting funding, like the next funding season maybe, but like if we're trying to plan like a logistic response to what people need and, and, and like imagine a supply line of we've got stuff to meet needs and we've got people in need, if you're going to do that in any kind of agile or efficient way without this regional data, you can't do it. And I am so impressed that this got done. So Travis, you're just like rattling off results, but like this really just hadn't happened before. This is why this is such a big deal. Sorry, I just I wanted to draw a point on it. No, th thank you. Thank you for adding that. And we'll have a slide here in a little bit that kind of shows a regional breakdown for the crisis call centers of where the increases and decreases were. So we're going to focus on supervisor challenges first. So in each of these graphs, I'm going to show you an area that I think is worth noting. So the first is the strength bar. So as we're thinking about topic modeling, the darker the bar, the higher the level of strength was in the responses being categorized in a certain way. So then you can see down on the X axis is the responses with this theme as being dominant. So we received uh, uh, just under 600 responses to the second survey and about 325 to the first survey. So in some cases, those two surveys were combined to give us a more robust uh, data set as it came to the narrative. And so that was the case in this in this survey. Um, in others, they were they were separated. And I think that we um, we indicated that you can see at the bottom of this. So uh, important to point out that lack of resources was by far the most frequent supervisor challenge that was identified. And if you remember, that could be, um, you know, we want to go remote, but we can't because we don't have the technology or we don't have someone to buy 20 new laptops for our mobile crisis team. Or maybe mobile crisis is a bad example, but call center might or, be a better Or example. even really, like even really basic things, like we'd like to do that, but we have a staff of this many. And if we do that, there's going to be a disruption in our ability to take calls. And we don't know how we're going to back us up for like the one week that that's going to take. Take. Exactly. You know, really, really, really challenging logistics for crisis providers across the country from like all the conversations I remember. Yes. So the next slide talks about frequency of job related themes. So you'll notice that the strongest, um, the, 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 the darkest boxes in this graph don't necessarily correlate with the most responses. So that means that the stronger responses were near the bottom, but fatigue, more work, safety measures, and clinical concerns were those 
biggest areas that were identified as, as a job related issue. So this wasn't just um, a, a supervisor, uh, but this was anybody, you know, how has your professional role changed? How do you feel your ability to perform your job functions has been affected? And these were the kinds of responses we got. The next one I'm gonna talk about is the frequency of person served related themes. So we asked a, a question like this, when thinking of the people you serve, what changes have you noticed in their demeanor hopefulness or resiliency. And what we saw um, near the top was that there was an increased acuity as people presented. So maybe they would normally present with an anxiety disorder, but they are presenting with an anxiety disorder and they've been drinking heavily for the last few weeks, or they have a number of other socioeconomic conditions, perhaps brought on by the pandemic that they are dealing with, which can affect the length of stay in a service like crisis residential. It can affect how long an intake will take uh, or a, an assessment with a mobile crisis team. It can affect how long your calls are. And if you know anything about call center operations, it's based, your staffing models are based on how long your calls are going to be. And subsequently, the breaks that people can take in between calls to do documentation, to get lunch, to use the restroom, whatever it is, but if you if you shrink those and you have less breaks, you might have a more stressed out staff. And as well, if your if if your staff also happen to not be as available because of COVID, because of childcare issues, whatever it is, well then that just exacerbates the issues that you're dealing with. So we're going to break it down now and go into the three areas. So the first was mobile crisis teams, and and this is these are the results of the second survey that were uh, that was administered in June. So we got responses from 27 states. Um, the highest participation came from Michigan, Texas, and Wisconsin. And if we talk about recent and current issues for mobile crisis, uh, the top two by far were care coordination issues and staff safety considerations. And I'm gonna give an example. I'm gonna walk us through an example here to talk about why care coordination matters in a healthy crisis continuum. So let's go back to those graphics that I showed you before. Um, and I've actually added in 23 hour crisis stabilization. So there are actually diversion rates, which are not official standards, but that many organizations strive for when it comes to serving the people who are in crisis so that they don't need to go to a, and use another level of service. So those diversion rates for a crisis call center example, uh, you, you want to divert people 80% of the time from needing to use mobile crisis, ER, psych hospital, things like that. And so you can see the diversion rates that they go across. Mobile crisis is about 70%, but in some parts of, let's say, New Jersey, you can see as high as 90 or 95% diversion rates where they can keep kids in the home without having to send them to the hospital. 70% diversion rates for crisis stabilization units and 90% for crisis residential. So if we put this into a flow and say that there's 500 people that are all accessing the continuum of services through the call center, if you can divert 80% of those people, then only 100 have to go to a mobile crisis team. If you can divert 70% of those people, then only 30 have to go either to a 23 hour unit or a crisis residential facility. Now, depending on those units, you could have either 70% or 90% diversion from there. That means of 500 people that you send through a crisis continuum and you, you send them through the call center through each of those steps, you could have between three and nine people that actually need to be, to be hospitalized, which is about 2% of the cases. Now, what happens as I animate this, when you start to cut out certain parts of the continuum, when the ERs are only focused on, um, on COVID cases and they can't handle that 7% of cases every year that come through for psychiatric emergencies, what happens when your mobile crisis teams are, for lack of a better term, immobilized and they can only do phone assessments? What happens when your crisis call center has lost a third of its staff because those are volunteers and interns who have subsequently gone home or gone to take care of their family? It creates a bottleneck issue that is ultimately going to send more people to higher levels of care when these crisis services have always had the intent of saving people money and keeping people out of more restrictive levels if they absolutely don't need to be there. So um, I'm going to go into the next mobile issue, but you'll see in these other two services that um, that care coordination is all also ranked very high. 
So this is a this graph shows the change from the the April survey to the June survey of um, what uh, how people responded. OK, so what what is different and what you can see on here? Staff safety considerations were much more referenced in the second survey compared to the first survey for versus looking at the bottom being overwhelmed by health concerns that had a 50% decrease in how often it was reported compared to the first survey. So that that can feel maybe a little uh, contradictory. Um, you might be worried about your staff and them being safe, but it might not be overwhelming you. Um, so that might be one way to look at that. Or uh, a supervisor might take a different approach than, than a direct a care staff, a frontline staff. Change in referrals, I, I, we kind of went over this already, but you can see that there was a, a significant decrease uh, in the first survey, and then things were kind of about the same. It was almost equally distributed between decrease, no change, and increase in the second survey. Crisis residential is next. So we had 29 states who had uh, respondents from them, um, and here's the results. So the top two of these experiences in the past two weeks, again, were care coordination issues, staff safety consideration. Notice that in the mobile crisis and crisis residential, each of these scored above 70% as the top issues. So there is quite a bit of consensus there when it came to these issues. These are the differences from the first to the second survey. So you can see that care coordination, staff safety, and feeling overwhelmed by clinical intensity all increased by by almost 50% and in two cases, nearly 75%. So, so the care coordination, if you can't get referrals to your crisis residential program, then you're not gonna have your beds full. And if you're a fee-for-service model, then you're not gonna be able to, to keep your doors open. Lastly is call centers. We had 34 states uh, with call centers uh, represented. And we look at these now the consensus isn't quite as high. We're looking at 58, 59% for these top two, which again are care coordination and staff safety considerations. Some of these more nimble organizations that have always had the ability to go to go vir uh, virtual or to go remote have frankly done it or were in the process of doing it already. So this just accelerated that for them. But for those smaller, you know, uh, community run or, or county run crisis call centers, that just might not have been a reality. They didn't have the infrastructure, the 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 tele the telephony maybe is it called the the telephone um, technology to make this happen for all their staff. And then lastly, look at these uh, differences. Again, care coordination was identified as a bigger issue in the second survey. Staff safety considerations very high, and then overwhelmed by clinical intensity. So maybe you're used to getting a certain percentage of callers who are suicidal or who are um, you know, struggling at, at an extreme level, um, you're getting more of those now, which can just add to the stress of your team. So this last can, map can that I'm we, gonna- Can we talk yes. about that? Can Let's we talk about that just very briefly? One of the other data sort of limitations that um, is really unfortunate, and I really wanna thank Quantify, I think done some interesting work with this, was that um, as we're responding to crisis, like it's very, very hard to know what the suicide risk is of our population, like in sort of near enough real time for us to be strategic about it. And we also understand um, that, that the work that we do as crisis providers has a real certain emotional burden. So if your staff is used to dealing with things at a certain intensity level, and suddenly you're dealing with much more severe calls and you're taking maybe the same call volume or even slightly less call volume, but the intensity is level, it involves more rescues or involves more suicide risk or more safety planning. What's happening is that like the bean counting that you're doing about what's happening to your work, your workforce uh, is, isn't giving you a, a good picture of what's happening. What you're, but what we're seeing from this data is suddenly the everybody's noticing that the clinical intensity is ratcheted up. We're, we're fatiguing our staff possibly with the same level of work or maybe increased work for that time of year. And what we don't have as a crisis care industry is a really good way for us to share like overall, what, because our whole system is not unified, like overall, how many calls are we really taking and what is the intensity level as a, as a great way of, of understanding what the state of public health is. Um, 
and we have um, Quantify that did, um, which is um, Tony Wood, who is the board chair of AAS. And I, hopefully what you're hearing is what, what a great national organization AAS is and how we, brought, how we bring people together um, to do these incredible projects um, sort of behind the scenes. Um, but basically Quantify looked at data and looked at overall population suicide risk and general population as compared to healthcare providers. And we were able to look at mental wellness indices and suicide risk indices for the US population. NPS they also did it by region. And we could see that the population had anxiety and depression symptoms. And we could see it on a day by day basis. We could see how the death of George Floyd and sort of the Great Awakening, how that was really impacting people's wellness. And what's happening is that in Travis's data, what we're also seeing is um, this change in the in in our in the responders, our crisis care workers, then also noting clinical intensity, and so we've got these disparate data sources that are telling and really important things. So it's telling us as an industry what we need to be doing logistically, and it's also telling us what the public health needs are. And so this data is not only important to us about how to plan, but somehow getting this data into the hands of people who are assessing the wellness of the U.S. general population is very important. And, and that's one of the reasons this is so valuable. Awesome. Thank you for um, adding that commentary, April. Um, I want to get through our last slide so we can leave some time for questions. Uh, the last uh, map here is a breakdown for the crisis call centers of uh, where the respondents came from, first of all. So the, we, we broke the state up into five regions. And so the, the darkly shaded states represent uh, where we got a response from. So the Midwest had a, had a high number of respondents. Um, but you can see that, for example, the the southeast had a number had, had a high percentage of their total states that responded. So if we look at the same graph from a different perspective, we can see that the northeast reported the highest increase in calls uh, during that time, and a, as did the west. Actually, the west was even higher. But the southwest states uh, had the highest reported decreases. So about half of them reported a decrease in calls. So it, it's important to know that, that, that COVID is not affecting behavioral health crisis services equitably across the country. And it might follow as cases are going up and down how these crisis services are being affected, or there might be a wave that kind of follows those things. So there's a couple things we can do here, and I want to move into these recommendations. And so some of these are for, for providers and some of them are just for communities. The first is tell your story from the mountaintops administrators, legislators, money savers, lend me your ears, right? We need to have the people who make decisions know about crisis services and not just speak in platitudes, but to speak in data and in outcomes and in the impact of lives on, on what you're doing. The second is to ask for what you need. Okay, I know I've noticed this about myself in the past where I can be really good at identifying the problem, but when somebody says, okay, what would you do? I just kind of go, well, I don't know. I'm only used to talking about the problem. But have your talking points ready. Have have your meeting with your local, your state senator or your representative prepared about what you're asking for. Um, access to PPE, competitive pay and, pay and benefits. This is something TBD Solutions was focused on before the pandemic was we're in a behavioral health crisis with our workforce. The third is to reevaluate your funding models. If you were a fee for service before, um, that might not be working out really well if there's not the utilization. And that's good for the payer, but it's not good for the provider who needs to keep their doors open every day. So there's there's this term right. called a... Can, can, Go ahead. Can I pop in that the National Health Service in England, they don't do fee for service, they do cost per head. So what they do is mm. they say, here's how much it costs per person that we serve. So if you have so many people that, that are in your population that you serve, this is our cost per person per person in our community to make this available. And they recommend, um, this is one of their, one of Ruth Allenson's big recommendations. So remember, she's one of my friends who first shows me what, and she designed the urgent care pandemic response in England, is that she also says you really have to start thinking about telling people what it costs per person in their population. Mm -hmm. Sorry, keep going. 
No, thank you for for bringing that in. Some of these some of these payment models are just antiquated, and they're not actually serving the person very well and and providing capacity. And you could even add add into this some value based purchasing concepts to say if, if you're truly diverting people from the hospital, then you do deserve some of the cost savings that happen there. The last thing uh, that we have as a recommendation is to demonstrate your value to bring your outcomes to current and prospective funders, uh, commercial health insurance, counties, VA, Medicare, et cetera. There are a number of funders and payers that do not have a well-developed continuum of crisis services, and those are uh, very important. Um, so I would like to uh, pivot now and see if there's any questions. I know uh, a handful of you have uh, found a way to use the, uh, the Q&A. Um, it might not be intuitive for everyone, but if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the uh, the Q and A box, and we will get to them as soon as we can. While we're waiting for those questions, um, April, I just wonder if there's any other reflections that you have as we talk about this data and you know where we go with it. Uh, you know, one thing I was going to say is that that. I consider this report in some ways the fault lines, uh, you know, where, where our infrastructure kind of crumbled or or at least was compromised a little bit and what we can learn from it. But as you look at all of this data, you know, wh what do you feel like is the most helpful next step? Well, let's talk about nudity because I feel like if you're still listening right now, then you deserve to talk about this and I think a compelling way. And, and of course, you've talked about fault lines, but I'm also going to talk about um, you know, you can always tell who's skinny dipping when the tide goes out. And so uh, it is, of course, the tide goes out every day, right? Usually if you're lucky, right? Uh, and, the, and the universe isn't crazy. But also I want us to think about the fact that we have set up systems that everybody in our industry knows has some very serious compromises and functionality. We know that, we know why, this, like there are, there are real saints, there are real mission oriented people in our field, but often we have not received the infrastructure that matches the scale and suffering of the healthcare problem we're here to work on. And we've not asked for the resources that we need. And then the tide went out and it was really clear that uh, that we knew who, who you know, if you're at a party, you kind of know who's taking their bathing suit off right under the water because you know your friends. But what <laughs> happened is the public all thought, the public all thought we had our trunks and bikini tops on. And they're surprised when they find out we don't have what we need. I think it's really important when it comes to these data systems that we start talking to folks like, I know you think we know this, but we don't. Here is why we don't know it. Here is what it will take to know it. Here is the value to you. And I also think, so like, please do advocate for the infrastructure you need and use this as a wonderful way to tell a story now that your community partners can identify with. And then the next piece is, and, and this is not, like I get nothing for this. Um, the reason that I am in the leadership positions that I'm in is simply because I showed up and I was shocked at what was not happening. And, and I'm so loud about it that everybody, you know, just backed away and, and here I was, right? But band, band together. So the reason to belong to a national membership organization is that, that our only job at AAS is to support our members, right? So Travis, when you talk about this, we don't really have any other dog in the fight other than to support people who are in the crisis care industry. So I can put, or people who are in suicidology. So I can pair Travis with a data scientist, or we can, you know, we can get companies who are interested who are also like to work with public health experts, and we can talk to Google with some authority. So being a subject matter expert and coming together when there are clear system gaps is incredibly powerful. Um, I would, I would say that there are some lessons we learn about this. So first of all, TBD Solutions has done quietly and humbly. Um, once again, I get paid nothing for this. I just think that this is important for the public to hear. Has done quietly and humbly these important things that the public, that the infrastructure, the official infrastructure was not getting done. And being disruptive, like being a disruptive innovator, everybody thinks that what that means is you're like, oh, I have a solution. And isn't that wonderful? But what it actually means is that if the system continues to not function, when a major event happens like a pandemic, when the when tide goes out and you find out who's not wearing, um, you know, who's not wearing swimming trunks, 
what happens is that somebody goes, I know how to get trunks to you quickly. And that those are the folks who start driving the system. And, and I, would, I would say that if the system is not serving your mission, it is okay to disrupt the system. It will be fine. The reason for nonprofits, and almost everyone who's listening is in a nonprofit, the reason for these, these nonprofits is to serve a mission. It's not to serve a system, it's not to serve an anachronism, and it's certainly not to serve a seat on a task force that doesn't do tasks and doesn't have force. The reason is to serve a mission. So when TBD solutions really, in my opinion, in this moment, exemplified what serving that mission is, which is if the data doesn't exist, use your professional networks to come up with a way to make it happen. Um, uh, this is why Travis was one of my first calls. Um, and I hope that there are some questions popping up as I'm you know, pontificating, but I really <laughs> believe in us. Uh, thank you for saying that, April. I think uh, I agree the, the importance of a, of a, a network of professionals that you can rely on is, is important. So whether that's AAS or NASCOD or CRA or whatever your affiliate organization would be for uh, for a trade association to consider getting involved with them. We did have one question come through, which was, will you be continuing the survey? No, the survey was closed. It was just time sensitive. Uh, we may do a survey again in the future. It would, it would be based on need and opportunity for partnerships uh, in that capacity. Um, and so Travis, one question that, Travis, yes, Travis, the answer is Travis did not say, but the answer should be, they'd love to continue that. What they need are funding and support because while it, uh, if there's no margin, there's no mission. And so they did the first one, absolutely TBD. And I, tra Travis can't say this. I can say this uh, because I know they did the first one just out of the generosity, out of their margins. Um, some funding came up, hopefully, to support the second one. But in order to keep doing these valuable things, what's needed or is fiscal support because you've got to have pay for people to do this. This doesn't happen by magic. A lot of people carry the mission. So if there's anyone listening to this who knows how to get funding to support ongoing data collection, I don't think uh, Dr. Philip Resnick or Travis or TBD Solutions or any of the other like several organizations like NASCOT or AAS and Travis, make sure you list people they get acknowledged, would love to keep doing this stuff, but absolutely yeah. can. If the audience can connect people with resources. I'm sorry, Travis, I'm, no, I'm gonna promote getting things done. Great, great point, April, thank you. Uh, a question I wanna pose to you all, and I put my email address in the chat is, if we do a future survey, what would you want us to ask? What type of questions maybe did we not ask in this survey that you would be curious about? So uh, Travis A at tbdsolutions.com, Feel free to send that to us. Uh, we are at the end of our presentation today. I have just two more announcements. One is uh, the Crisis Residential Association has their virtual conference October 14th and 15th. You can learn more at crisisresidentialassociation.org. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura Vredeveld, who is going to uh, finish up uh, our last two slides. So thank you, April, for being here. And uh, we look forward to um, talking more about these things in the future. Thank you, Travis. I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, if you're not familiar with TBD Solutions, I would encourage you to check us out online uh, at tbdsolutions.com. Um, we do a variety of work supporting crisis systems, managers, leaders um, across the behavioral health sector. Um, got a, a great team of data analysts and consultants, so we would love to talk to you to hear more about your needs. Um, so check us out or give us a call or an email if you have questions. I definitely want to thank Travis and Dr. Foreman for their words of wisdom and sharing the information from the survey. And please reach out to us if there are questions you would like answered from your peers and counterparts across the country. We would love, as April does, to uh, connect you to one another and to try to systematically answer those questions. So thank you for your attendance and you all have a great day.